Thank you for joining us. We have a great guest today. Um, one of the main reasons I asked Lacey on was she had a, a pretty tragic incident happen with her daughter Chrissy at a place that you normally wouldn't expect something like that to happen. Um, and it really something that occurs all the time is is what triggered it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today too. My name is Gabriel Williams and I'm the CEO of Spectrum Research Group. We are the makers of Neural Balance with Anandinol. Anandinol is a patented herbal mineral vitamin blend that was created to help kids with calm, focus, sleep, anxiety, sensory overload, um, things like that. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. If you want to learn how it works, you can just ch check out our website, neuralbalance.com, and click on the How It Works tab. You can also, of course, learn more about us on Facebook. And if you want to interact with other parents, get some support, find out what strategies they use to help their children flourish. And maybe if you have a strategy that you can share yourself, check out our Facebook group, Neural Balance Support. You can check out the Spectrum Report TV on YouTube. And of course, if you want to head over to Rumble, we do have a page there that has some uncensored content, stuff that would get us in trouble on YouTube or Facebook, but we think might be helpful to you. So you can check us out there. And I would like to introduce now Lacey to the show. She's going to tell us a little bit about her journey, her daughter, uh, Chrissy, um, as I mentioned, a uh, particular incident that happened to them as they were just out enjoying um, a weekend. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about like th about that. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Lacey. Hi, Lacey. How are you doing? Hello. I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing all right. Doing all right. Looking forward to this. I thank you for uh, being willing to talk with us. Anytime now, you, you you've you been a longtime user. Chrissy's been using Neural Balance now for about five, five and a half years. Five you and said. a half years. Okay. Yeah. And how old is she now? She is a little over seven. Her birthday was in September. Okay. So I guess I'll ask you, kind of tell us your story. Like, wh how did you, why did you seek a diagnosis? How did you figure out that she needed extra support? Um, kind of bring us up to speed. If you were meeting another parent for the first time and you were kind of giving her your background so you could give her some support, uh, let us know. Um, when Chrissy was born, her sugar didn't register at all on any device in the hospital. And she was a limp rag doll. Nobody could tell me what was wrong besides that her sugar was too low. So we were in the NICU for, I think it was 14, 17 days, something like that. And she had stopped breathing at one point. She still didn't really cry very much. Nobody still could explain anything to me. And once they got her sugar up and going, we were able to take her home with proper training and CPR classes. And we also had to have a heart device that we took home with us to stay with us for a while. And I thought it was really weird when I got her home. She slept all the time. I would have to wake her up to feed her every feeding. It was like she was never hungry. She didn't ever have any issues. She didn't move very much. And that continued her whole entire infant life. And no doctor could explain anything to me on why she was this way, that it was probably just because of the sugar issue. And Chrissy had all of her jabs throughout her whole infancy. And when she was, I, she was just almost 12 months old. And I took her into the doctors to have those done. And when I took her in, my child at 12 months, almost 12 months old, was walking, saying words. She could walk upstairs. She could hold her own bottle. Like, she was doing decently well. And I took her in there. She had what she needed to have. And I had to carry my child out of the doctor's office and she just didn't respond. Um, I'm curious because something that I hear a lot is uh, when they brought their child in for those certain 
you know, milestone visits where they do get certain jabs and things like that. I hear also the perfect form is uh, my child is already sick and had been on antibiotics. And when we got in there, they said, well, we'll go ahead and do this. It's safe, but we'll give them some acetaminophen, children's acetaminophen to bring, you know, down any fever or discomfort. And those three things together, I hear often from parents that say, like you did, my kid was different from one moment to the next, one day to the next, everything changed. And those three things occurred often together. Um, was that the case with her senior nurse? At the point when I had taken her in, Chrissy had only ever been sick one time. And it was just an inner ear infection. And it was probably about three months before that. It was the only time I ever had to take her in for anything before this issue happened. And at that time, she... Like, I try to do as much, even before we found out, as natural as possible, even in my life. So I didn't give her Tylenol and Advil and a whole bunch of things, even when she was teething, because, you know, I just, I did more natural frozen fruits and those little teethers and stuff, and it worked okay for her, but the jabs didn't work okay. But afterwards, I had found out that... There's a thing called the MTHFR gene. And if I would have known, and she could have been tested, I would have known that it's not a good idea to get the MMR vaccine along with all the others when you have the MTHFR gene. Oh, so I knew that there was a correlation between um, how their body breaks down and and utilizes B vitamins, B6 in particular, but... I didn't realize that the MTHFR uh, uh, gene mutation also had a problem in relation to the jabs. Yeah, I, I, I will never, and when I explain everything to people, I will never be somebody to say jabs cause autism because I know that's not the case. But I will say they amp things up, they bring on some symptoms, and my child is absolute proof that that happened. And if during the whole time before that, sit down, please. Before that, if a doctor just would have informed me that they could have tested her for MTHFR, I would have already been researching it and I would have known this stuff before I took her in. Uh, do you know what's the alternative? So if, if you have your child tested, and you find that they do have the MTHFR gene mutation. Um, do they do things differently? Do they spread them out? You can space out? them. Yes. You can space them. <clears throat> the MMR vaccine with, I think it's influenza and one other one. You have to space them out with MTHFR. So she got the MMR at 12 months? They gave it to her. Hmm. Yeah. And then they got mad at me. Why? Because I wouldn't take her back in for any others. And they dropped me as a patient. And they even, I asked them not to. At the time, my other daughter was 15, 14 years old. And I had asked them not to give her that jab. And I had taken her in for another one that she had needed at that time. And they actually gave her the MMR jab and she passed out cold on the doctor's floor and right then right when they gave it to her she just passed out and she doesn't ever they were like oh kids do that all the time and i was like no she doesn't and she kids might but she doesn't yeah and did she have any long-term after effects that you're aware of um i think now she uh she's She'll tell you. She's a little off sometimes after that had happened. Um, she she forgets things a lot. And we'll joke back and forth because, you know, in our household, the things we deal with daily is autism and ADHD and things like that. So sometimes I'll look at her and I'll be like, maybe you need tested. Mm. Like, maybe we just need to see. And she'll laugh it off and I'll laugh it off. But you know, it's a reality. Sometimes people don't even know that they have it. And 
Oh, I think that's the case in a lot of, a lot of time, especially yeah. um, when you get into the realm of what we would call high, fu- it, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to know what the correct terminology is this week, but right. um, I know we're, yeah. we're not saying Asperger's anymore. Now we say high functioning, but then I've also been told that high functioning, low functioning can be um, a p- potential problem. So I don't know, but I think a lot of times the people who are very smart and a little quirky um, yes. are often on the spectrum of high functioning and, and maybe just don't realize it. So uh, it might be more prevalent even than people realize. Right. But um, that's why we do things like this though, because you know, when I first started working with this company, Rain Man was about the extent of my understanding and, and that's nothing, you know, so, uh, we want to do everything we can to bring awareness to, um, not only people who are dealing with it, but people who don't know about it, um, but might have the opportunity to be helpful to someone or something like that. So, okay. so they, they, what was the recovery like after that? I mean, you, you guys were my recovery. Oh, do you started with neural balance like she, right away? She was about a year and a half old when I started because nobody could give me any answers. Nobody, I knew a week after probably what the issue was and what I needed to start researching. She um became completely nonverbal. Like she, she didn't even really make very many noises and all textures had started bothering this child while she was eating like mashed potatoes and yogurt and cottage cheese, which were things that she absolutely loved. And I, before Chrissy even came along, I had previously worked in an autism school, which was absolutely crazy that my past had tied into this. Um, I had actually babysat an autistic little boy when I was in high school. I had at the time that Chrissy came along, I had my teaching degree already and I went through some special education classes. So I knew what I was looking at very fast. And when no doctor could help me out, I mean, the county that we live in, in Michigan, isn't up to date, I guess we'll say, on their special needs things in the county and... So I just started researching everything that I could, and I don't even know, it had to have been on Facebook or a Google search that I did or something, and I found you guys. And I watched almost every video you guys had on your page, and I cried along with the other parents, and um, I took the jump, and I said, we're going to do this, we have to do this, this is hopefully going to change our lives forever. And it, besides the big storm in the beginning, it has been absolutely wonderful. So you, now when you first started, then I don't even think we had the capsules yet. So if she had suddenly become such a picky eater, was it difficult for you to get her to drink the drink powder at first? No, because Chrissy, she is the... Her entire life, besides when she was a baby taking bottles, the only thing that she'll drink is juice. And still, even though she's seven, I water it down with like three quarters water and a quarter juice. So when I would put that into her juice, it kind of just, I can take a drink of it and I can't even hardly tell that it's there. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people like it just mixed with water because it it kind of tastes like a fruit punch or whatever, but good clean stuff. So, So how have you... How'd you reintroduce different textures of foods and different things like that to her? I mean, that, that, I mean, your whole life changed overnight. So there was, and, and, you know, the other parents I talked to, they see gradual changes or they, um, the way that their child is developing from the get go, um, things are a little different, a little quirky or whatever, but um, the overnight change that you experienced, I do hear that as well sometimes. And the, the common thing that I hear is that it's just such a jolt. I mean, everything literally changes. You have a different, it was insane. We couldn't listen to music anymore. No more 
movies on TV. Um, I have to, well, now she knows how to spell some words. So I have to change the word. She can't watch people cry. She oh. can't hear people cry. So to find a, a show on the TV that has no singing, no music, no loud noises, no fighting, no crying, we don't watch TV. Right. She can't deal with any of that. Um, we're really lucky if she finds a song that we like on the radio. So like mama only gets to watch a movie or listen to the radio if Chrissy stays with grandma and then Chrissy can't be away from me for more than about three hours without having a complete meltdown. So I, it's me and Chrissy, right? single mom and yeah, it's You're fun, doing a great though. job though. It's fun. Yeah. You're doing a great job. Thank you. So what, um, what kind of changes did you see in her? Because you, when you started giving her neural balance, you were also doing other things. So I don't want anybody to think that, you know, neural balance is the, is a cure or it's the end all be all it's part of many things. It's there are a lot of moving yes. parts to having an autistic child. It and was, you... it was a huge part in the beginning. Like it was my, one of the first things I see, I will say, the whole two month or two week storm you guys talk about and right. I won't ever tell anybody any different. That is the most trying time in your life. Right. And I cried probably every single night. She cried every day. We stuck it out. I wasn't going to stop because I knew that it just had to get better from there. There was no way that we were going to go down. Right. So I just kept giving it to her. I mean, she, she had, days and days where she would hardly sleep at all and then she would sleep all night long and i'd be like yes finally she's sleeping all night long and then you know she would um like things would change off and on the first thing that i seen that i knew i couldn't give up was she started walking up steps again and her coordination was kind of coming back she couldn't after that day of the jabs there was no stairs involved in this kid's life. We had to carry her up and down them for months. Was and she unwilling or unable or like unable. she kind like, of forgot how to navigate them? It was almost like when she would look down, she would get vertigo. Oh. And she'd go to try to step up the steps and it was like her feet wouldn't even work. She was uncoordinated and clumsy. She was so clumsy. We had to teach her. I actually have videos of her at her one year birthday party which was about a month afterwards and we're clapping and rejoicing because she's learning how to walk again she literally stopped walking so it was it was a big big deal that when i seen her take a couple steps up the stairs i knew that it was working it was helping her it because we weren't doing anything else besides teaching her sign language and using neural balance for probably the first six months and oh so that's how you open the lines of communication with her again that's we outstanding sign language as a family that's outstanding yeah i read that often parents who have a deaf child don't even learn uh, sign language so uh, that's i mean that's awesome that that you guys did that uh, the lines of communication are important and they, the it's kids need to, yeah, that's, it's, it's a shame. So that's neat that you all did that. So the whole family learned. Uh, pretty much. Uh, my mom, I mean, there really isn't very many of us at that time when we found out about Chrissy. Well, I already knew, but right. my husband was still in the picture. And then once we definitely knew what was going on, he decided that, that life was not for him and took off, which I know a lot of people are going to be like, Oh, what a, but I would rather now looking back on it, being the bigger person in the situation, I'm glad that he had that in him to let me know that he couldn't do it, that it wasn't for him instead of sticking around and making life miserable for right. Everybody. Right. Right. So, I mean, I'm okay. I'm mm. happy. Chrissy's happy. We're doing great. You know, it's, it's just what happens. There's some people that can't deal with it. And I completely understand. It's hard. Yeah, it is. It, I hear that a lot. I have a lot of respect for autism parents and when single moms, especially because 
it's i was a single parent for a while and i my child you know my children didn't have autism and being a single parent is tough as it is but then all of the additional support that they need is definitely um wears on you um so what uh, okay so you you saw that she was making progress she was starting to walk upstairs how was she what other ways did you kind of see chrissy coming back um she would i think she started saying mom which was not a new word i mean she was saying mom before it all happened but she was saying mom again she was calling everybody mom instead of just me but i was still happy that the word was coming out um we started noticing that it was almost impossible for her mouth to form the words that she needed to form and you could tell that she wanted to talk and she was trying to talk and she was making more noise but it wasn't coming out she'd get really really frustrated so that's when we started with the sign language and i think the sign language took away a lot of her insecurities and her frustration and i think it opened the door for a lot more things to come through and i think it helped the neural balance in a way because there wasn't so much held in frustration in this child's body that she was trying to fight with every single day and we didn't go with a peck system or anything like that because at the time with her being as young as she was she just she didn't get a lot this is being recorded right yes can we pause this she's screaming for me in the oh yeah sure go for it all right made a lot of things easier um the next thing after her walking upstairs, I remember this like it was yesterday and I just, I couldn't even believe it because at that time she couldn't take off clothes, put on clothes, like she stopped everything. And I had walked into the living room after making her her lunch and she was sitting on the floor trying to put her socks on and she had had one on halfway on her foot and I just like, started jumping up and down and screaming and telling her yay that she was a big girl because it was like her hands, she lost everything, all form of, it was, it was weird. She couldn't even, she didn't even nod or shake her head anymore to questions. So when I seen her putting her socks on, I knew that, you know, we just, we had to continue with the neural balance, obviously, because I absolutely refused to put my child on any form of medication. We haven't had her on any medicine at all for anything besides neural balance. And at this time still, doctors weren't listening to me. Nobody was seeing her. And they said, you know, that she was just a slow learner, that things would get easier for her. So I had taken it upon myself and I had contacted our local special education school, if that's what she would like to call it, and the ISD, and they had sent out an occupational therapist to my house to start working with Chrissy. And after she had been there for so long telling me that, you know, well, she's just developing slower than most children and she'll get the hang of it and everything like that, they had brought in a um, speech therapist. And Chrissy, at this point, I don't know, we were like two, probably maybe a little bit over two years old. And they, both of them, had told me that I needed to stop teaching my child sign language and that sign language wasn't going to get her anywhere in life. And their exact words to me were... How is she ever going to order anything at McDonald's if she doesn't know how to communicate? I think that was probably the least of your worries at the time, right? McDonald's food. It well, was I don't. That insane. doesn't. Yeah that that doesn't make any sense to me. It seems like the ability to communicate would be one of the first and foremost. Right, right, right. And that's going to open the doors to everything. I mean, mm -hmm. really, that just doesn't make sense. Well. And, you know, that goes along with, um, 
you you didn't just settle for this is life now like you're like how do i push her how do i teach her how do i help her and that's huge because i've i mean we've gotten blowback from people who are like you shouldn't try to do anything people who are artistic are who they are we need to love and embrace that and not tell them they're they're the less than or other than and and i'm like we're not telling anybody they're less but if you're so crippled with anxiety that you won't leave the house, then how can we come alongside you to help you and support you? I, I've never run into anything like this in my life, except for honestly, the, the, uh, some of the autistic community, because you wouldn't tell someone with cancer or with gangrene or, uh, you know, a, a myriad of other things, you wouldn't say, don't treat that. That's just who you are. It, it is part of who you are and it's not, and it's not to be ashamed of, but if, if it's keeping you from flourishing and thriving and enjoying life to the fullest, then how can we come alongside and support? So I, I'm, I very much respect that you took the initiative to learn sign language because you realize communication is going to be key as we help her work past all of this. How did yeah, she take the sign language? She learned so fast. It was absolutely amazing. Within one day, she was doing the sign for more and eat and drink and using them correctly. That was the big thing. She just wasn't running around and to tell me that she loved me, she was signing more. Like she completely understood it. And I was blown away. Yep, and you're still doing the sign right now. We don't communicate that much in sign language now because Chrissy has flourished so much. But um, at the time, sign language was our main thing. And when they told me that, I kicked them both out of my house that second. Like, I told them that I didn't need them with Chrissy anymore. And they could leave my house. And I was going to continue to do what I wanted to do. And I was going to figure out a way to do it better. So I got my degree in special education. And I went to college. And I started learning. And... I have been Chrissy's teacher for five years now because I refused to take no for an answer. That's great. And she's doing great. She's doing a lot better now. Yeah. So are you, so then you're homeschooling plus you're doing like an ABA, is it ABA type therapy? Or? I actually got my ABA license too. Okay. And that's another thing too. I had no idea that that was such a controversial thing. And then <clears throat> of course I yeah. hear, I hear some, what I find often happens is a good system is only as good as the worst people that use it. Right. So I I've heard some of the things that have occurred in the name of ABA and I thought, well, that's garbage, but that's not real ABA either. So it, I mean, you just, you take any kid and you teach them so that they can function in the world and be happy and get along right. with people. And it's, it's not, and for me, I just don't understand all the pushback. Now I do understand if someone's being oppressed or abused or it's going too far. Sure. But if you know that, that you can expect more from this person, then you're going to try to push them in that direction if you want them to succeed. So I, I really respect that you um, took such initiative. I mean, you became an ABA specialist so that you could help your daughter. That's awesome. Yeah. So a lot you, of people have the issue because they feel that you're teaching or you're treating the child like a dog during ABA. You are rewarding them with a snack, a treat, a reward for doing the trick you asked them to do. Right. Um, I mean... I'm not, I'm not treating my kid like a dog, but I do tell her, and you heard me in the beginning of this before we started recording, if you're good and we can get through this and mommy can finish, I'll give you a cookie when we're done. Which doesn't sound that different from many parents, right. but I, I mean, right. that's where I guess uh -huh. some people are looking to be offended or some people only have that view that they've heard where it was taken too far. I don't know, yeah. but 
it seems to me that you want your kid to be more resilient. You want them to learn as much as they can and, and be able to function and even be around people and be a joy to be around. So people want to be around them. It, it yes. just makes sense that that's what you would want for your, for your child. So I do uh, commend you for all the work that you've put in and the love and the support yeah. that you've given her. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that we were a positive part of that. I'm, I didn't realize what a need there was for a product like Neural Balance until I started working with this That's company. Um, and it's getting, uh, it's more and more prevalent too. There was an incident that happened. Um, this was last year, right? Was it as far it as back as September? Okay. And and I, I was very surprised by it. And it was what the parade was kicking off the fair. Yeah. So this was a pretty big deal and it was something that just totally blindsided you. Huge thing. Yeah, yeah. Explain to us what happened to you and Chrissy that day. Okay, so the day before was Chrissy's birthday. And it was well her birthday party. And it was the first time that Chrissy had ever, ever had a birthday party and there were children there. And I had invited all of my friends that had autistic children to come to the party and play with Chrissy. And I bought this huge bounce house and we had water beads in a pool and the kids just had a sensory filled day. That was a lot of fun and there were no meltdowns at the time. Everything was great. Now that I think back on it, I mean, I might have made a wrong decision and filling two days in a row full of sensory and too much for her maybe but um the following day the fair in the county that we live in was having their parade to start the fair off and Chrissy had been to a parade I think only one other time and she was little she was in a stroller and we made sure when we went to that one that we were far out enough that it wasn't right downtown where all the noise and the fun stuff was happening. This time we had taken headphones because she has just gotten over putting headphones on her ears because ears are her big thing. You can't touch them. It's hard for the doctors to look in them like her ears are a huge issue. And we finally got some headphones and she had agreed to put them on and things were going good and I had heard and so had everybody that the county that we are in had agreed from now on at parades and things that they were doing that sirens and horns and all of that stuff it wasn't going to be a thing anymore they were going to do sensory free with that kind of stuff because of children like Chrissy. And I was like, well, we can take her. She can see the horses. She can see people walking and the floats and the band and we'll have her put her headphones on. And we were there and Chrissy was loving it. And a huge, one of the big fire trucks, not, not just like the ladder truck, the huge, huge fire truck came around the corner where we were sitting. We were on literally, we were downtown on the round part of the curb where the two roads came together, sitting on the curb with our feet on the road. And this fire truck, the only, there was a ton of fire trucks and didn't have one issue with any of them. And he come around this corner to turn. I, he, this man was so close in this fire truck to us, somebody probably could have spit on the fire truck. And he didn't do the honking fire truck horn. He did the shrill, loud whistle that, like, I thought I'd gone deaf for a minute. And as soon as it happened, ugh, I looked at my kid, and her eyes were rolling back in her head, and... She started having a seizure and I just, I froze and she kept this noise up and everybody that was around us, babies were crying, little kids were running, adults, like I thought my ears were bleeding and 
Christy couldn't come back. So I grabbed her and my mom and I started walking away from everything. And Christy was walking at this point, but she was twitching and making like these really weird Tourette's noises with like vocal stems. She has never done anything like this in her entire life. And we get back to the vehicle, which was because so many people were parked. The vehicle was, I would say, at least a half a mile away from where we were at. So I had to get my kid back to the vehicle. And she's still twitching, still making vocal stems. I'm like, this has completely messed up my child. And I thought it was just a sensory overload, like people say. And I was like, I'm going to give her some time. We took my mom back home. We went back home. And she kept it up. And I have videos upon videos of this child making vocal stems. And, like, she was repeating, like, Tourette's people do things that I was saying and noises that were happening outside. And this was just that day. So I put her in the bathtub. This was an hour after we'd got home from it. And then I put her in the bathtub and I used, you know, lavender Epsom salt and tried to calm her down and use some essential oils on her. Like I was trying everything I possibly could and nothing was working. And she just, she went, she didn't have an epileptic seizure where she was thrashing around. She ended up having an absent seizure and I was watching her and she just was completely zoned out and I couldn't get her attention. I was right in front of her face trying to talk to her. When she finally came to, she acted like absolutely nothing had happened and started playing again. And I took her to our emergency walk-in clinic and I get her in there and I'm telling them what happened and she's in there doing the vocal tics and I am... A complete mess because I know that some autistic children they do do vocal stems and they do you know twitch and Chrissy hand flaps that's the only thing she's ever done in her entire life is flapping her hands and like humming she'll hum when she does it but what my child was doing was Tourette's a hundred percent it was crazy so finally the doctor that was in there, thank God for this woman, Dr. Nye, she looked at me and she said, do you know what a noise-induced seizure is? And I was like, I have never. And she says, you know, a lot of children with autism have seizure tendencies, and it's very, very well known that children with autism can have seizures at any given time, and especially ones that are brought on by lights and loud noises. And what Chrissy now has has been diagnosed, and she has noise induced seizures, and the noise induced seizures, and the noise from the fire truck has also now brought on Tourette's. So we deal with her autism, absent seizures, and Tourette's at times. And I still don't have all answers. We still haven't got into a pediatric neurologist. Um, I just, there's not enough, I feel there's not enough care for children like my child. And we're taking this one day at a time. I'm trying to take this one day at a time. As you can tell, I'm still very emotional about the whole thing. And I guess as soon as I can get into a pediatric neurologist that wants to take me seriously, instead of thinking like most of them have since I have been talking to them, that my child is just doing what autistic children do, then I'll find somebody that cares and we'll get to the bottom of it. But until then, we mostly sit at home. Because I'm very afraid that when or if I take my child out to do something, that there's going to be an ambulance or a cop car or anything at all. And I don't have answers and I don't know how to prevent things. And, you know, when she gets really stressed now or, you know, something loud happens, thunder, something that she doesn't like, the Tourette's amps up like crazy 
And she, since September, I have noticed, I mean, obviously she's not in my sight 24 seven, but I have noticed since September, she's probably had, I would say six to eight of the absent seizures. And after she has one of those, the ticks and the vocal stims are really, really bad. Their facial ticks and like her eyes will blink a whole bunch and her mouth will kind of twitch around and her head will jerk sideways. It's, oh, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And this is all new that new behaviors that began that day that at the parade. That yeah. yeah. So, um, it's hard, I guess, then to determine, did she have this before and the fire truck triggered it or the fire truck triggered it and that's when it began the whole sound induced because it sounds now like she's more prone to seizure based on certain external stimuli than she would have been before so yeah you know what and I mean? after like, the doctor told me you know that autistic children are more prone to seizures than other people i get that because I know that a lot of autistic children do have seizures, but I had no clue that this was even a thing. Like you don't hear, I have never in my life heard this. It's the first I've heard of it. And I've talked yeah. to hundreds, if not thousands of parents and heard their stories of, you know, how, how they've adapted um, to help support their children and things like that. I've never heard of it either. That's why I thought, you know, I'd, I'd like to get you on to raise some awareness about it because if, you know, going, the thing that's heartbreaking hearing the story is you're so excited about being able to do this thing, right? This thing that you have not been able to do. Now you're able to do it, go to a parade. Um, you're thinking all the precautions have been taken care of, right? The city has yeah. said, we're going to make things a little more sensory friendly, but, but, yeah. you know, and so it sounds like you had someone who probably was well-intentioned and wanted to just give everybody a party, but something that loud can affect kids that aren't autistic. Oh, yeah. I would assume oh, it did all the kids that, around us, right? Well, I, I hearing issues. I mean, I, I would assume that, a sound induced seizure would not be exclusive to a person right. with autism thing for other people too. Right. So you have you people, someone in the audience with epilepsy or, or whatever. I mean, you, so, so for parents, one thing they have to think about is the environment that they're going into. You can never be too safe because uh, when it comes to certain triggers, potential triggers. So you may have somebody's word that this is going to be more sensory friendly, but you also have to come into it with a plan. Right. Yeah. So I had actually called the fire chiefs when I found out what was going on and I explained it to him and I was crying, bawling on the phone, trying to get this out. And his words were, well, I'm sorry this happened. I don't know what to tell you. What do you want me to do about it? Oof. And I was like, I'm doing this so that I can educate you on Where, what happened. Yeah, be aware of it. Tell your and people he was like, that well, it happened. I'm sorry yeah. that it happened. Uh, see, well, and that's the that's the that's the spot that also people are in in today's litigious society. If you say I goofed, then you're potentially yeah. opening yourself up for liability. So if he were to even say to you, yeah. "Thanks for making me aware. I'm going to make my guys aware so we don't do that again," yeah. then potentially you know he's assuming liability because he admitted that they did something wrong right so i can uh in a way understand but not so much he should have been more kind with you and certainly more right. willing to ask you know how can i communicate to my guys so that we can avoid this in the future because that's really i'm assuming that the only reason you were calling anyway was to right make to them aware of that, it hey this is a possibility i didn't right. even know it was so a day at the fair and that was the kickoff of it right so you guys probably had a whole day planned and that really threw her for a loop so now it's uh gosh it's five months later and you're still experiencing some of the additional um 
symptoms that it right she's so pretty much diagnosed with Tourette's now pretty much okay I mean so... I haven't officially seen the pediatric neurologist because nobody's seen me yet but, but the, the doctor has said that they um that her diagnosis would be noise induced seizures with an onset of Tourette's so has the behavior escalated or plateaued or decreased or where do you think you are in this? Is it, you, do you think day. it's something, what's that? It depends on our day. I right. mean, like, um, I know if I was to take her to a fair today, we would probably have huge problems with it. So we mm. try to sit home, stay calm, do, cause I don't know what to do. Nobody, nobody has told me what to do. No neurologist has agreed to see me because of this. No. And because of this and me being a single parent, I am on state insurance. So it's even harder. Right. And now you have to also be conscious of the, it could, if, if she's this much more pro t prone to seizures now, then you also have to think about the lights and flashing lights yes. and things like that could potentially yep. be a problem. So yep. this has just added a whole nother layer to things for you. Yeah. I kept, I was joking, you know, with my mom, but deep inside of me, I wonder if I'm joking because I'm like, what am I going to have to get licensed in now so that I know what I'm doing? Right. Because I kept, bettering myself for her and i thought that i had gotten to the point where oh i can i can do this with ease now i know what i'm doing and now that this is added i'm like what other classes do i have to take and what else can i do to make my child's life even a little bit better and i just yeah we just stay home pretty much now after this um does she are you able to like does she like to play outside to get out and get in the sun yeah, or does. is that and too much stimulation service dog so we take the dog places we went we had a park day the other day and it was during school so i knew a bunch of kids wouldn't be out people wouldn't right. be yelling and everything and we went to five different parks and she ran around and then you know once all the kids started coming out we head home because you know, they bring on a lot of anxious feelings for her. And I don't yeah. need her having a seizure in the middle of a park playground. So. So would you say she's fairly up to speed verbally now for her age? No. No. But, but if, great um, if she sat here with me right now and tried to carry on a conversation with her, um, you probably wouldn't understand anything, but mm. well, some things you might, but I understand it because I know her words but she doesn't just carry on a conversation like you have to initiate stuff and then like you have to almost tell her what to say like yesterday she turned around to me and she was just like she said change it and she kind of stomped her foot a little bit so I had to walk over to her and I was like how do you say this better you know and you have to walk her through it and there's sounds she can't B's, D's, P's, K's, C's, like she can't pronounce them at all. Um, we're getting better because I didn't even think that it was this fast. And I actually seen a memory on my Facebook of a year ago and we were just like starting to say ABCs and mm. she whizzes through ABCs now and she counts and she can which she wrote her name for the first time like three weeks ago and i cried and so we're we're getting there a little bit at a time well you are like i said yeah i, I can't say it enough you're doing a great job i'm it's very impressive um what you've gone through yourself and everything that you've put to learn more so that you can be more effective for her the love and the patience it's uh, autism moms are a whole different breed i know so that that kind of makes me wonder um so like i mean what do you it sounds like you don't have any time for yourself or to recharge for yourself or really. like how well the whole thing is is that on top of her and her autism and her issues i have fibromyalgia and lupus and shorgan syndrome and hashimoto disease so we're both just struggling all the time. Right. And I just have to step it up and ignore how I feel and get the job done for her. And then even though I'm tired 
when she goes to bed at night, mama stays up till four o'clock in the morning because I don't ever get time for myself. So, you know, I'm up until four o'clock in the morning scrolling Facebook or reading or, you know, do getting in the bathtub. That's like the dream of all dreams if I can actually get a bath or not. Right. So that's what we do. I mean, she hasn't right now at this point, her and I haven't been apart for probably a month. It is. So is she, but she sleeps through the night now, okay, and all of that? Most of the time. I mean, there's times that she'll wake up four or five o'clock in the morning and she'll holler for me because she she's scared, so she doesn't get out of bed, which is a wonderful thing. Yeah. And she'll holler for me and I'll go get her and she'll come into my bed with me and we'll fall back asleep. And But for the most part, yeah, you'll come into my room, huh? But for the most part, oh, yeah. That's so, good. I have animals. Yeah, she talks. She just yeah. yeah. So cute. It's so you're um I one of the other autism moms that, that I'm friends with, um, I asked her the same question. What do you do for self care? And she said, suck it up, buttercup. Yeah. That was it. And so I, I, and I kind of hear that a lot and I don't mean to laugh about it. I'm more impressed by it than anything. Um, yeah. There's just this resilience and, and uh, like, you don't have a choice. So what, you know, what do you, what, yeah, do, what are you going to do? You got to do it for your kids. So you do yeah. it. And I'm impressed by that. Um, well, so, now I had found out also from teaching her sign language and everything one of the main reasons, I mean, well, one of two of the main reasons, she doesn't have all of her jabs. So obviously, you know, they're going to turn us away. But another reason why she's not in any kind of schooling is because I have not found even special education schools, autism schools, anything where anybody can communicate through sign. Really? I mean, none. sign language is pretty prevalent in the autism I know. community and there is from what none. I understand. There's none. They want to do the PEC system always now. So what is that? That's with the picture. Chrissy, hey, go get your go get your schedule with arts and crafts on it. Go get it. Yeah, get it and bring it here. It's a system um, that uses little pictures. And when they want something, they just pull the tag off oh. and hand it to somebody. Which okay. to me, you're not even trying to teach my kid to talk. Right. That's not really, I mean, it is a form of communication, but it's very simple. I mean, yeah. too simple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have one because obviously there's words that sometimes I'll, she'll get so frustrated with me and I'll look at her and I'll be like, I do not know what you're saying. Is there something in the house that you can show me that's like this? Do we have something? Is there a book that has this in it? Because I try to go over everything. She gets so frustrated with me. Can you go put it back, please? Thank you. And, um, I get it for some things, but now they even have PEC systems on playgrounds around here so that they can just pull an adult over to the board and point at something. And then their communication is done. But it can't be the end all be all. That's the thing. Right. I'm, I mean, I'm okay with, I guess that in some limited right. capacity, um, you can use it alongside, but it, the more advanced right. kids that can handle it, they should, you should teach them sign language because right. it's just, I mean, you, you're not relying on having the right ta table or whatever, you know, to communicate. So I, yeah, I think um, more people should learn sign language and my, my son and I, my youngest is uh, 19 and he's talking about one when when he has kids one day he's going to teach them sign language he's not hearing impaired but he just said i think it's such a valuable thing to be able to to use sign language and communicate with people who aren't used to just meeting someone randomly that can communicate with them yes. and that he thinks that more for and you know he had a good idea too um it would be neat if there was just a universal sign language rather than yeah. like American sign language or this or whatever, ASL, because ASL. if you're learning sign language, you're, le you're learning a new language, right? So whether you're French or German or American or whatever, 
um, if you all learn the same sign language, then everybody that knows sign language can speak to anybody else in the world who also speaks sign language. And I just think that that would be um, a very helpful tool for a lot of reasons. But the ABCs um, are the best to learn because everybody uses the same. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't. And like we talked about earlier, it doesn't make sense to me parents that have hearing impaired kids that don't. So why your doctors would be, especially when you're teaching her that you're using her brain, you're exercising it. We're always told, you know, it's like a muscle. You got to use it. Right? right. So now they're, they're uh, dissuading you from teaching her something that would help her communicate more effectively. It makes no sense. Yeah. I would um, actually have her when she was younger, when she was learning the signs, I would do the sign, say the word, and then do the sign and the word together. And then when she would sign it, I would at least make her make a noise so that she could attempt to say it at the same time. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. So I, I want to ask you too about this, um, here, uh, we're recording this on the last day of February 29th leap year. And so this is still about a month away, um, April autism awareness month, but I've, I've also learned that people have strong opinions about that. Some people do, some people are pretty indifferent, but I always thought it was a great idea because it, during that month, many companies are focusing on autism awareness. So people that normally wouldn't give it a thought now are exposed to some of the ideas and hopefully given some more understanding, but then other people just hate it all together. So autism awareness month for April, do you love it or do you hate it or do you care? And if so, why? I mean, I have to care because it's my life, but, um, I don't feel that even though it is autism awareness month, that there's really any awareness to people that are not affected with it every day. If everybody, and I don't want anybody to take this wrong because my brother had cancer and I, I, I get it, but everybody knows the cancer ribbon knows you know, cancer awareness knows everything. And then you get people that don't even have a clue about autism. And even though there's an autism awareness month and a down syndrome awareness month and a muscular dystrophy awareness month, only, I think it's only mostly important to those that deal with it. And even though some companies try to push it and you see your friend post something on Facebook about wearing blue that day or so it's not it's not thought of it's not after after the month's over with and everybody's tired of seeing the blue little puzzle pieces all over the place nobody bats an eye at it again and the education for autism I think is almost non-existent especially to people that have no clue. I mean, I've had people in the store say hi to my child and I have to look at them and tell them that she's nonverbal. And then adults look at me and they're like, oh, she's a mute. Or the like, I've had a man after I told him that she was nonverbal, get down in her face and clap his hands in her face. So I know I can't get mad because they don't know anything, you know, you don't see people that have cancer saying, oh, I have cancer, and then somebody, you know, clapping their hands in their face, like people get it, and they know what that person's going through, but I don't think very many people understand, and I don't think very many people, most of the time now, want to even understand, because it inconveniences them or their lives, and they just... They just don't want to hear them make noise or have a meltdown in public. And they don't want to acknowledge that, you know, it's it's part of them. Instead, they want to look at the parent and be like, well, can't you just tell them no? Can't you, you know, discipline your child? Can't you? And uh, I don't think autism awareness really helps them very much, except throwing the blue puzzle piece out there. I hate to say that because I really wish it did. 
and I wish that it did more than what it does right now. But if I didn't have a child with autism, and just like you said, you only knew of like Rain Man at the time, that's probably what most people that don't have to deal with autism in their daily lives even think of now is Rain Man and, you know, Temple and things like that because it's not in their face, it's not in their lives, it's not in their family, it's not anywhere so they don't have to be aware of it until they need it face to face in the store and then they make the wrong decision i think that maybe even us that have loved ones with autism need to probably strive a little bit harder to spread awareness and education about it i try to all the time and sometimes most of the time falls on deaf ears but i don't shut up and I don't care how controversial it is. And I most of the time don't care if somebody else has a different opinion than me. Because I'm the one that's going through it. And I will, I will answer any and all questions. You know, if I tell somebody that Chrissy has autism in the store and they're like, oh, can she talk? Oh, does she have a learning disability? Oh, I will be more than happy to answer any question that anybody has about it at any time in my entire life. But when a man gets down in my child's face and claps his hands, I just got to grab my kid and walk away. And I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's fair to me or Chrissy. And I think that maybe a lot of autism awareness companies and places could maybe do a little better. Well, there you go. I, I, yeah. and that's one of the complaints that I hear about it is that I, it, it's not, a, it, it's not enough. One month is not enough really to, to truly raise awareness. And, you know, that was one of the things at, at our um, church, I, it, it just kind of occurred to me, you know, there's probably a lot of families that would like to go to a worship service and they feel like they can't we because can't. either they're embarrassed or they're afraid they'll bother someone or yes. somebody will be me or the, the, the reasons are so many, right? Yes. It's the self doubt. So, um, I started asking and I found that there were a lot of folks who wanted to, wanted to start going back to church again and they felt like they weren't able. So we started yeah, talking we have a about church that. actually right down the road and there was a man down there one time in a car and Chrissy has wanted to see, we've never been to a church and she wanted to see the inside and we walk inside and she was just in awe. But I was telling the guy, you know, cause he was like, Oh, you can come to church. You can come. And I'm like, yes, but you guys sing. You're loud. The bell rings the, you know, there's babies crying. I can't have a baby crying around my kid ever. Like, zero percent chance of Chrissy right. being okay with this and I was like I I know that this is part of your life but I can't have it be part of mine and it sucks but um we walked up those stairs and everything and she seen the cross and she seen him hanging up and she knew who he was and she pointed it out and she said the word she prays every single night with my mom over the phone they say their nightly prayers and she always wants to go to church and I know she can't right I'll have to send you a link. She can watch ours on live stream, maybe. Um, but yeah, and the what we ended up doing. So I, my question was, how can we make this more friendly, right? And one of the first things I thought was setting up a separate place that's a little quieter. We can live stream into that room, and the lights can be down, and it wouldn't be as loud. Uh, but then I thought you know, there's more to it than that. That's great for the families who would want to retreat to something like that, right. but still be part of a body. Like after the service is over, you come out and you're, you know, around people and everything. If, if your, your kids can handle it. But another piece of that I thought was the ones that don't need to retreat, but want to be in the main sanctuary. We need to educate also our congregation to be patient, to be understanding, to be supportive, to be loving. And because, you know, this is a, might be a new thing that we're, we're going to go through. And, um, we, we did present that we do have a little boy who sometimes gets loud, but he sings and he vocals, he stems vocally and things like that. And, um, we just have learned to love it. I mean, we'd rather that he's there than not. 
right? He's yeah. part of a beautiful family. He's a great little kid. So um, that's that's where I think that's why I kind of wondered about the autism awareness thing. Like, I can see it being good on a certain level, um, but I, that's the biggest complaint that I've heard is it doesn't go far enough. It's kind of lip service. Um, and now, like everything, it's become a marketing thing. So companies yes. can throw that up and make a little donation and be seem like they're part of the community, but the month is over yeah. and they're done and they're not talking to anybody with autism and, and or any of that. Um, so I, I can see where it's also become a ploy. So more needs to be done, I think, on an everyday level. So um, I do appreciate you meeting meeting with me being on the show um telling us your story you're you're um uh, pardon my french a badass thank we you we appreciate you some days i don't feel like a badass but but I you just going. have to remember that you are yeah because that's what badasses do they just get back to it so i don't have a choice yeah well we're glad that neural balance has helped um I, did you mention that you've taken it too? Have you ever tried I've it? I just tried her drink. Yeah, like okay. I wanted to make sure that it didn't taste funny and didn't, you right, know, right. especially I still try it sometimes if I like switch a juice to make sure that it's not, but right. I also use um, one of those coffee frothers, the milk frothers. Okay. So like we really, really blend it up because I have noticed that sometimes it's still in little balls and she'll see yeah. floating around in the cup. There's a little trick to that. Like I I just mix mine up in a regular water bottle. I pour a scoop in and I just shake it, but then set it down and let it sit for like two or three minutes and then shake it again and it'll be completely dissolved. Um, but um, no, I mean like for yourself, for stress or relaxation or any of that, have you ever just tried a full dose? We have a lot of... Of adults that take it people off the spectrum they started taking it because they saw that it was working for their kids so they started using it for stress anxiety sleep things like that and it worked very well for them we actually have a um a large number of senior citizens that use it just for sleep so yeah it, it's good for moms too so check it out if you're feeling too stressed let us know if you yeah. need more that's quite a bit sometimes i bet i bet well, thank you so much. Um, any parting words, words of wisdom before we go? I'm just, I'm not the only badass out there. All of you all are badasses if you're dealing with this kind of stuff. Amen to that. Well, thank you, Lacey. You have a good one. Give yeah. Chrissy our best. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. That was Lacey Fish telling us about um, her journey with her daughter, uh, Chrissy and with autism and neural balance. And I had never heard of sound induced uh, seizures prior to that experience that uh, Chrissy and Lacey had. So um, that is something new to me. I, if it's new to you, I, I hope it helps out. Um, definitely let other people know and look it up, see if there's something that you can do to safeguard your family. If you're going out into an area that you might come across some sudden loud noises or anything like that. We certainly uh, appreciate you joining us for this episode of the Spectrum Report and look forward to seeing you again next time. Because of neurobalance, my daughter can sleep through the night consistently, which hasn't happened in years, and we are so thankful.